Recently, I've uh, made some material on the state of the dead according to the New Testament. I have uh, talked about how the New Testament says that the dead are in fact conscience, with a focus on believers in Christ, that they are conscious, that they are with Christ. There are those who believe in soul sleep, which is opposite of what I just said, and uh, a gentleman named Drew Costin, who has interacted with the show, uh, has written an article on this same subject. What I want to do is read through the article and comment accordingly. Uh, this is from his website, concordantgospel.com. The title is, Is He the God of the Dead or Isn't He? I'll read a little bit and then comment as we move along. He says, Most people today completely misunderstood, misunderstand what death is. They've bought into the lie of the serpent that you shall not surely die. Believing that the dead aren't really dead at all, but are actually alive as ghosts in some ethereal afterlife dimension. So right off the bat, he is begging the question, which means he's assuming something. Now when he says that people are not believing that the dead are really dead, completely assuming that physical death is the very thing up for debate. I mean, he's assuming his whole premise right at the beginning. You see, the reality is we believe people are physically dead. No, we, we believe they're dead. Okay, we understand what physical death is. It's the ceasing of the biological function of the body and brain. But, of course, our position is there's something a part of man that is more than physical and continues beyond the body. Now, Drew may disagree. I'm sure that he does disagree. But he can't just assume it. But because he does assume it, then we must just simply be saying that man is not really dead. No, he's physically dead. Now, you're never going to convince us of your position when you start off like that, when you say that we don't really believe we're dead. You need to talk about what death is. If physical death is the opposite of physical life, right? It's the ceasing of physical life. But as we know, uh, the very position that we're holding is that man is not physically alive, that's uh, going to happen at the resurrection, but that there's something in man that continues conscience. It doesn't mean he's not dead. So, I mean, this completely just begs the question and mischaracterizes what we're actually saying. is isn't going to go very far at all. Now, we all know that in the New Testament there are different kinds of death. Uh, in Ephesians 2, it talks about those who were sinners who were dead in their sins. Jesus talks about the dead burying the dead. Well, they must, well, they're the physically alive, but they're dead in another sense. So you can be dead and alive in another sense. We can be physically dead, but our spirit can be alive. Our spirit can be conscious, in other words, and go beyond the body. So you may disagree, but that's the very issue you're going to have to address and not just start out your article begging the question. Now, when he says that we buy into the lie that you shall not surely die, well, no, no, once again, we believe we, believe we will die. I, we, I don't know anybody that says they're not going to physically die, of course, and that's exactly what uh, well, a lot of people believe that's talking about uh, spiritual death. I disagree. I think he's talking about physical death. But either way, when people believe and understand that it's talking about physical death, well, they do accept that that is, in fact, what is going to occur. Um, if it means separation from God, uh, disunion with them, if those who take it as that kind of death, well, they believe that you know, that actually happens too. But so nobody's saying that they believe are not surely going to die. Actually, I'm pretty sure Drew believes that you cannot lose salvation. I guess he would have to. Um, I'm, I'm forgetting exactly what he would say about that. I know many of those that associate with him do. Well, now I've always said that that's believing the original lie. But uh, he goes on, and he says, I want to present you with some very simple passages of Scripture that prove the dead are actually dead and gone. Uh, once again, well, again, begging the question, we believe the dead are dead, physically. That's the point. Uh, meaning unconscious, at least until their future, future resurrection. Okay. Psalm 6 and verse 5. This is from the Hebrew Scriptures. For in death there is no remembrance of thee in the grave. Who shall give thee thanks? Psalm 115, verse 17, The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. Ecclesiastes 9 and 5, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, and even their name is 
forgotten. Very simple, right? Those who are dead can't remember God or even thank or praise Him because the dead know nothing since they are unconscious. Many Christians try to ignore these passages. Well, I'm sure that there are some who try to ignore the passages. But there are plenty who don't ignore them, but they still have a biblical reason for believing that the dead are in fact conscious, which I'll state in a second. Many Christians try to ignore these, or claim they don't actually mean what they say. Well, I'm sure that uh, people would say the same about uh, Mr. Coston. But the plain meaning is so easy to grasp that if one didn't have a preconceived bias towards the doctrine of the immortality of the soul, they'd read those verses and immediately agree that there are dead or indeed conscious. Um, first, uh, I noticed that, at least yet, and I don't think he does very much uh, as far as what I remember from the article, it's interesting that he doesn't deal with the texts that I think are pretty simple, the ones that most people, in fact, bring up. Well, I think those are pretty simple, too. You see, the what's, goo, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. But he says, very simple, right? Well, uh, then he says, uh, what, read it again, plain and meaning is so easy to grasp. Now, uh, the honest truth is that these passages, if you look at them, are pretty good for his position. Um. I admit that the texts themselves are pretty plain and seem to suggest that the dead are unconscious. The other reason I disagree is because just as much plain teaching in the New Testament says otherwise. Do they contradict? No, I don't think they contradict. Either, uh, which is what I said in my video on this very same matter, that one would have to get into the discussion of whether things changed or whether these writers spoke truth as they knew it, but in fact did not have as much knowledge. We do know that the New Testament is a fuller revelation. For example, in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, it says, uh, Jesus Christ to abolish death and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. Uh, did I read that right? Abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. To bring something to light is to make it more seeable. Concerning what? Life and immortality. Uh, certainly, the state of the dead and the state of the mind or the eternal life, the everlasting life that people have when they come to Christ and are saved because I don't think we'll be separated from uh, Christ by death, even in the state of uh, unconsciousness and death. But no doubt, those things are a part of the New Testament teaching, and I think we should all be able to see that the New Testament is a fuller revelation of things. And once again, when he says that these texts are simple, uh, yeah, I admit that these texts... Uh, are difficult to harmonize with the texts that are just as simple and just as plain in the New Testament. Now, why can't I say that he's ignoring the ones in the New Testament to fit his preconceived bias? Well, the reality is uh, I'm the one, at least here, stating that the text that he's provided here, these texts, not the Ecclesiastes one, but the other in the Psalms, yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're a little bit difficult, and I have a hard time with them. Um uh, but since the New Testament is full of revelation and says very plain teaching itself, and because of the very real possibility even that would have to at least be considered that things can change about the state of the dead as God sees fit, uh, then I have no problem saying that I'm not fully able to recognize exactly what that situation is. Did things change? Did uh, the writers of these Psalms just simply not have full revelation in his writing as he understood? Well, those things I'm not prepared to speak about. That's me having an honest assessment about the text, which I have no problem saying. I don't have the answers to everything. Now, the ones in Ecclesiastes are not difficult at all. Uh, even though those are the ones people cite the most, the dead know nothing, um, Ecclesiastes is not a problem at all. There's ones in Psalms, yeah, those are pretty good for the position, and not quite sure what to do with them uh, yet in my studies. Now, the one in Ecclesiastes, 
For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. Now it goes on to say, for they have no further reward. Now does Drew believe that? Is there no, is there no uh, uh, age enduring life? Is there no uh, aeonian life? I mean, is there no reward at all? So when they die, that's it. Isn't a resurrection a reward for the righteous or for people from the Lord? So what about that text? Notice it says, for the living know that they will die. What's the contrast? The dead know nothing. What do the living know? The living in this life. Now, I'm wondering, in Ecclesiastes, it says a couple times that there is nothing better for man than he should eat and drink and enjoy his reward. Really? That's it? What we are eating and drinking in this life is can't be surpassed? You see, the book of Ecclesiastes is written from the perspective of Solomon, who's considering life, things done under the sun. Uh, Solomon departed from the Lord for a period of time, and I believe he's reflecting on his insight into the world, that he cites that from an earthly perspective of simply from the view of being under the sun, there isn't anything better for man, and that once the dead die, there is no further reward. That's it in this life. The living know that they will die. The living in this life know what's going on in this life. The dead know nothing what's under the sun. So, the reality, and it even says their name is forgotten. Well, not by God, obviously, right? But it's it's that which is happening under the sun. So Ecclesiastes is not uh, a problem at all. Okay, but let me go on. Well, let me say this. Let me go to my text now. Now, he said those are very simple. I got a simple one for you. Uh, one that I actually forgot to deal with. I was kicking myself for this, but in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 2, in verse 19... Uh, Jesus cleanses the temple, and then the Jews said to him in verse 18, What sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now, isn't that pretty, isn't that pretty plain? Or is there a way for them to try to say it's not really him raising it up? And they come up with their own ideas, right? But Jesus says, Destroy this temple. What's the temple? The temple is the body. It says uh, in verse 21, he was speaking of the temple of his body. What do people do in a temple? They live in it. Okay, the people are not the temple. They live in the temple. Notice that? And that's why Jesus is able to say, you destroy the body, and I, who can exist outside of the body, evidently, will raise the temple back up. So Jesus has to be able to exist independently of the very temple that he's going to rebuild. But he says, I will raise it up. Now, that's pretty plain. Now, Mr. Drew who is a nice guy, and he's a pretty reasonable guy. I wish he would have dealt with some text like this in the article because I find them just as plain and simple as those other ones. Now, uh, people say, well, the Bible says God raised him up. Well, and I believe it. But it also says he will raise himself up, and I believe that just as much. Are we going to believe the one but not this one? So evidently, both are participating in him being raised up. Now, David, and God told David and accused him of killing Uriah. Well, he didn't kill Uriah. Actually, the, uh, I believe it was the Ammonites, the Ammonites, I believe it is, uh, they killed Uriah, whoever it was. It was actually the enemy army that killed him. But then goes on, God goes on to say, you killed him with the sword of these, uh, I think it's the Ammonites, but I can't remember. Well, so it was both. David killed Uriah because he got the plan into motion. And he authorized his own army to withdraw from Uriah, allowing him to be killed by the enemy army. Well, God grants his son the authority to raise himself from the dead, and thus both are said to raise themselves up. But so Jesus raised the temple. Now, we live in temples, but we're not the temple. The body is something we live in. There is something inside of man. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Uh, In verse 16, Paul says, Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, the body slowly dying, getting old, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. You know there is an inner man. Now he goes on to talk about, in the very next chapter, uh, we know that if, uh, i got to be quick with this, I'm not going to make a long video. Um, Verse 2 says, For indeed in this we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. 
Notice he goes on to talk about being clothed. Now, we're not clothes. Clothes, clothes are something we put on. He's talking about the body. Uh, because he said in verse 1, if our earthly tent, a tent is something you live in, you're not the tent, which is our house is torn down. Uh, but he goes on to say, for indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed. I didn't know it was possible to be unclothed, according to some of my friends. Well, evidently it is. We do not want to be unclothed. He doesn't say it's not possible. He just says that's not what we want. But to be clothed so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Which is something he says in 1 Corinthians about the resurrection, immortality, uh, death. He talks about that, being swallowed up. Um, he goes on to verse 6, therefore being of good courage always, and knowing while we, while, now listen, while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be home with the Lord. Now, I know what they would say. It was the resurrection. We want to die and then be with the Lord. That's what, of course, I would say if I were them. But in the resurrection, you're not absent from the body. He says to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Okay, when you, if being at home with the Lord means in the resurrection, you're not going to be absent with the body anymore. Absent from the body. And in verse 6 again, he said, while at home in the body, we are absent. So the contrast is not being home in the body and being with the Lord. Very clear. Outer man, inner man. I think those are pretty plain. What's wrong with those texts? He goes on to say in chapter 12 of the same book, 2 Corinthians, that it is possible to be outside of the body. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, in verse 2, whether in the body I do not know or out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a man was caught up, raptured to the third heaven. But the point is, for Paul, he didn't see it as impossible to be out of the body. That's exactly what he says. Our friends and I don't just mean Drew, might correct Paul and say, oh, Paul, don't you know you can't be outside of your body? Revelation 6, the souls of those that were martyred were under the altar crying out. Yeah. Well, that seems to state that the dead are conscious when they are, in fact, dead. But we know that they're dead. Let me go on with this article because I didn't want this to be a long one. Uh, it's also important to realize that the concept of the immortality of the soul and an afterlife realm for ghosts, of course, a word that people would not use. Ghost does not mean spirit. It's an old English word that may have meant that at the time. That's not how we use the word now. It wasn't actually taught in the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, doesn't mean it's not, in fact, taught. Uh, very little is said about the resurrection in the Old Testament. I didn't say it's not taught there, but very little. But, of course, much more in the New Testament, right? Because full of revelation. In fact, they taught a physical resurrection as the way one will eventually look upon the Redeemer. And if something isn't taught in the Hebrew Scriptures, then we have to be extremely cautious when we read the Greek Scriptures not to read ideas into them that weren't taught previously in Scripture. Oh, I disagree. Uh, it's not... The New Testament is full of, full of revelation. There's all kinds of things we could find in the New Testament that the Old Testament saints did not teach about. Not because... Uh, the Bible doesn't teach it, but because New Testament teaches it, and it's progressive revelation. I disagree with that completely. Um, where does he go? Uh, he says, It's important to remember that just because a Pharisee or audience member of Jesus might have been recorded as believing something that wasn't taught in the Hebrew Scriptures... This isn't a good enough reason to believe the concept itself is scriptural or true. It's more likely that they were adding extra scriptural ideas to what they believed to be correct doctrine. And often was not only the case back with them, but it also is the case with modern Christians. However, as you know, those verses I listed above obviously aren't enough to convince the average Christian who has been fully indoctrinated into the idea that the immortality of the soul is a fact. Well, I may not be your average Christian because I used to believe that we were unconscious in death, and I changed my mind from looking at the very plain text I just quoted for, to you from the New Testament. Uh, so hey, don't count me as one of those. The reality is Christians actually, there's plenty of people out there that uh, have read those texts from the New Testament and are convinced. Um, I'm going to give you a passage from the Greek Scriptures this time. 
he means the New Testament, one that proves definitely that this isn't a fact at all. Now he quotes about, uh, from Luke 20, verses 27 through 38, about, uh, it's just too long for the time that I want to make with this, uh, where Jesus references the burning bush passage where God calls out to Moses saying, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and uh, makes a point about the resurrection. But uh, I'm not going to comment on that, though, not just because of the time here. It's already 20 minutes. I've quoted many other passages in the material I provided recently. He told the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. Of course, they're going to say, just move the comma one, one word over. Well, I don't doesn't convince me at all. Jesus used this idiom over and over, verily I say unto you, and it just happens that here, where it's a good case for us, the idiom includes another word, and it doesn't go with the following phrase. That's not convincing at all. Uh, and there are many other like that. Uh, those texts are pretty plain. Now, in Philippians, Paul says uh, he would much rather... Let's go there. It's just like 2 Corinthians 5. He says... For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I am alive on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. But I am hard-pressed from both. Both. Two. Having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. He's got two options that he's weighing. Living and dying. Not living and dying, and then also being with the Lord. Because... Uh, notice what he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, we don't want to be unclothed, which unclothed meaning in a state between clothes. The clothes there was the bodies, very clearly. You can be unclothed. He didn't want to be. Well, wait a minute. I think, I thought that he said just now, here in this text, that he does. No, there he didn't want to be. Uh, it was in contrast to having the new body. That's the preference. The resurrection is the big thing, and it's the main thing. He didn't want to be unclothed so much as he wanted to be the new clothes. But uh, here, it's in contrast to living on in this world. He's not even talking about the resurrection. doesn't mention it. But he says, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Now, notice it's not, uh, well, he wants to die and future be with the Lord. That's, that's not what he says. Because if it's just being with the Lord, well, he can continue to live, which he said is Christ. What does he die or what does he gain in death? If he's just going to die and be unconscious, he doesn't, he doesn't uh, gain anything. Uh, because remember, the option, the contrast, was living on for Christ's sake. You see, he can keep on living and do more for Christ, and it's more fruitful for uh, Christians that he was laboring with. So it's not resting so I could just end all that. It's I can continue to do that, or I could die and be with the Lord. That's what he says, to depart and be with the Lord. That's pretty clear. And in 2 Corinthians 5, just to back up what he means here, he says, to be absent from the body and be with the Lord. Can't be the resurrection. So these are all pretty clear, I think, just as much. Now he goes on to say, so with that in mind, as well as taking the article on death that I linked to, which I haven't messed with here, to at the beginning of this post into consideration, again, please read if you haven't already, it's now time to throw out the idea uh, that the dead are actually still alive. Well, once again, that's uh, begging the question on what you mean by death and what do you mean by life. The f okay, nobody's saying that the physically dead are still physically alive. Has he heard anybody say that? I haven't heard anybody say that the physical, physically dead are physically still alive. That's, of course, not what they're saying. That's that's just not a good way to approach this. And to reject the lie that you shall surely not die. Kind of like believing in once saved, always saved. Uh, but again, it, when it comes to the context of this discussion, I don't know anybody that says people don't actually die. I'd like to meet one who believes like I do if he would actually give me a name. I would like to have a talk with them. But anyway, those are my comments.